Thank you all so much for joining us for what's going to be in a very interesting, but very insightful. And I hope that you all be able to enjoy this next conversation that we're going to be having with leaders across the U.S. representing different voices, especially being able to bring you to our table. We're not about adding more chairs. We're actually creating our own tables, talking about what it means to be part of our community. We're going to dissect our complex identities. We're going to talk about the future of economies as well as celebrate our culture. And most importantly, how do we build together for collective power from here? So I have a very special round of guests. Uh, they're going to be introducing themselves. So with that said, why don't we get started? Are you all ready? All right, let's go. So uh, we'll start with Jessica. Oh. We, what we want to get to know you, Jessica, is... Tell us a little bit more about your origin story, especially where your people are from. What are some of the things that you saw grew up that influence what you're doing now and why you're passionate about that? Yeah, well, thank you for having me, Lily. Um, so I am the proud daughter of formerly undocumented immigrants from Mexico. So they're from La Ciudad de Mexico. And they actually came to LA first. Mm -hmm. And I am the first of the family born in the United States. So I have an older brother who was born in Mexico, mm -hmm. also came undocumented. And so I am part of what's called a mixed status family, which has its own uh, layers of, of complexities, right. I think. Uh, we moved to uh, Texas when I was four and a half after the Rodney King riots here. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing that stands out as I was thinking about Latinidad and, and my origin story is how I was raised as being to be very Mexican, mm. right? So not Mexican-American, but Mexican, not Chicana. And there was actually this uh, negative connotation with Chicanoness with my family mm, mm. because they came to the United States and they were here during that era where they they didn't connect with with that identity and they saw them as you know cholos oh. and you know oh. violence and all growing up it was you are not Chicana you are Mexican right and I was raised in that culture uh, but it was also very interesting when I got to Texas because we were the first Mexican family in a very white mm -hmm. area. And uh, I think I learned what other meant. Mm -hmm. um, not only was I Mexican and didn't know the language, right? I only knew Spanish. I also was of a different religion, mm -hmm. right? So I was raised a Jehovah's Witness. And that meant that I couldn't celebrate holidays. I couldn't do all of these Christian things and frankly, Catholic things, right, that were uh, defined by what we define as Latinidad, right? So I wasn't doing the Christmas stuff. I wasn't doing, you know, any type of Easter stuff, no holiday things. And I was always put in a, in a, a room during mm. those times, during the holidays, right? Because Texas culture is very <laughs> often <laughs> very Christian and very religious right. in a different way than I was. And I think that was defined a lot of my experience growing up around identity and around being Mexican, being Mexican-American, what that meant. Uh, I ended up going to Stanford University as the first in my family. Mm. I know, as the <laughs> first in my family to go to college. I, uh, and as I've gotten older, I think I am still very proud of my heritage. I'm proud of my culture, but uh, I also understand that I have a lot of privilege, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that's a really complex place for me to be in. And I, I think I struggle with it a bit because although I am at a different status in, in many ways that are seen as like successful, my family is not, mm -hmm. right? My family still low incomes, still lives, you know, four families in one house, right? <laughs> like my brothers still live at home, right? With their, with their children and their wives. And I have a brother that's incarcerated in the Bay Area, right? Serving 17 years. And uh, I have a brother that's, you know, handicapped. I still have undocumented family and it's really difficult to sometimes process mm. that. Uh, especially when I'm, you know, in a round table with people mm -hmm. like you, right, where we've defined Latinidad as this, I don't know, this almost like a monolith, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I, again, I'm proud of my culture, but sometimes I find it really hard to connect with what we have defined as Latinidad in America. 
because it's rooted in white supremacy mm-hmm. and colonialism, right? And it has allowed for the erasure of indigenous Latinos, of Afro-Latinos, of, you know, of Asian Latinos. And uh, that, that's difficult for me. And I think I'm, I'm st- trying to process that. Uh, and I'm currently in a nonprofit venture capital. And uh, I am the chief investment officer of a, a venture fund that invests in early stage entrepreneurs um, working in the progressive movement. And uh, we are pro-Black working towards collective liberation. And I think we're one of the only venture funds that has labeled themselves as pro-Black. And sometimes, you know, I get pushback from people in our community. Mm. Well, what about the Latinos, Mm. right? (laughs) What about our community? Don't you invest in us too? And it's like, yes, we do. And also being pro-Black is not exclusionary to to being pro-Latino, right? And uh, those are just some of the issues and I'll give everyone else time to to talk. But uh, I think... I am very proud of where I came from, and I'm very excited to hear about y'all stories. So we went right into the deep. (laughs) So uh, good morning, good afternoon. We're all awake now. (laughs) As somebody who's also an immigrant and indigenous roots, I definitely can, you know, hear your story as well of having that identity where you don't have anybody that, you know, that you can relate to and some of those cultural changes. I'm going to go to Sylvia, continue on the theme of immigrant. Tell us about your experience, your origin story, what you're doing now. Tell us everything, Sylvia. Tell us everything. Yeah, (laughs) my story is very long because basically when people look at me, they would never think I'm Latina. Um, I actually was born and raised in Peru. So my parents moved to Peru, Lima specifically, in the 80s. And they moved from China. So long story short, they moved there because just better opportunities. And uh, there's already a Chinese community there. Mm. And so they moved there in the 80s. It was not the best time in Peru. Um, this is this was actually the time when a lot of people were leaving Peru because of terrorism. I mean, like communism at that time. And uh, they actually were like, you know what? We already we don't actually have money to leave. So they actually ended up staying. And obviously, they made it in mm-hmm. life because otherwise I wouldn't be here. Uh, but yeah, my siblings and I were were born and raised there. And I actually went to a Peruvian Chinese school mm. my whole life. And eventually I moved to the U.S. for college uh, here in L.A., actually, USC. And uh, I've been here since. Um, But my story is, I feel like it's it's complex because growing up in Peru, I had like a mixed identity, right? Like Mm -hmm. at home, I I spoke Cantonese with my parents. I had a I ate different kinds of foods. Uh, But at school, I was just, you know, like. Latin, essentially, um, you know, with a tiny hint of like Chinese. Um, and I think moving to the U.S. even felt more complicated, I guess, for me, for us, you know, as like proving Chinese. And now I feel American because I've been here my whole adult life. And um, it's interesting because I think in conversations like this, I, I feel more Latina. But then when I'm like with, you know, maybe in a community where people identify as Asian more, I'm like, okay, maybe I'm like more Asian. I have no idea. But <laughs> it's one of those things where, I mean, there's no labels, right? But right. Um, I think one realization I had going back to Peru, because I was just there for like a vacation slash wedding. And uh, there's just no place like home. Uh, yeah. Like I went back and I felt like I was myself, especially post pandemic. I was like, oh my God, I miss the feeling of just being yourself and not, you know, have labels and just like talk to all your friends and like not feeling like you don't belong. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do feel like I haven't found that here yet. Like, yes, I have like tight friends. I have a tight community, but I don't feel like I'm my full self yet mm-hmm. here, which is, which I have to figure out through therapy, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and therapy is great. You're recommended to everyone. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, and it's helped me a lot, right, to figure out, like, who I am. And it's probably a journey that I, I still have to go through. But, yeah, now, um, you know, I after after college, I worked at a bunch of tech companies. And um, my career actually started in writing uh, because I started writing to get better at, like, mm-hmm. my English. And so... Now I'm, I'm obviously fluent, but back then it was just 
It was terrible. <laughs> um, and so I started writing about things I found fascinating. And it was around tech and like growing up in Peru, you don't get exposed to any of that stuff. And actually, some of my writing went viral. Like hundreds of thousands of people saw it when I was in, co- in college. I mean, and I had no confidence <laughs> at that time. And that's when I was like, oh, I have talent for this. So I like grew publications to like hundreds of thousands of readers. Um, and eventually now I run my own digital marketing agency. Uh, work with some tech companies, some nonprofits, um, and, and some VC funds, and it's awesome. I have employees across the world um, and do things my own way, which I've always dreamed of. And the pandemic gave me that push that I can just take any risks, and it's fun. I love it. And I love that you have also ventured out into your own entrepreneurship journey. Um, and for the folks that, that may not know, All of this, what we're actually doing today, we got started probably, what, like five, six years, six years ago? ago. <laughs> Around a table. Yeah. Eating sushi. Eating sushi <laughs> in that corner. Specifically to address the two things that you all have brought to the table, right? It's like we are not um, one or the other as far as like from when we look at the complexity of our communities, both racial, but there's a lot of bias. There's a lot of um, harm that's been done. And I think one of the parts that we want to also, we wanted to, when, with Sylvia, we were like, well, how do we help our community also address that and heal that? Because if you saw all the people there, it was also very Oof. different backgrounds. Yes. Yeah. And at the same time, how do we create new opportunities for our communities? How do we build together? How do we support each other? And so I'm proud to say that Sylvia is not only a friend, I'm the tia, but you yes. know. <laughs> but uh, somebody knows, somebody we've knows. also, she's also advising LTX. So I think that's a great example of how we can all collaborate with each yeah. other, support each other's efforts. So thank you for sharing. And then we'll come back to some of the insight that you brought in. Mario, yeah. now to you. All Tell right. us. First of all, I'm admiring all the artwork over oh, here. Yeah. But so thank you. If you can share a little story, I'm sure there's a yeah, lot of meaning there. Yeah, I'll get there. into that. Um, amazing stories, by the way. Like, thank you. And Jessica, I've known you, but like hearing your story, <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, so a uh, little bit about my origin story. So um, my dad was born in Mexico. He My good here was around 19, and my mom was actually born in Los Angeles. They met um, my mom going on vacation. So wow. I have this like. <laughs> where are they going? This, yeah, where are they going? Uh, yeah <laughs> right. No, so my, you know, all of my grandparents are from Durango, Mexico. Um, that's where obviously my dad's from. And so she would go back every year, and that's how she met my dad. So I have kind of like this interesting 1.5 generation, have an immigrant father and a mother who very much identified as Chicana. She went to mm-hmm. Cal State LA. Um, so I was born in Monterey Park, oh, right here. down the street here, but uh, my parents uh, made the decision when I was about five years old to move to Simi Valley, which oh. if you're familiar with the Los Angeles yes. area, yes. very different. For sure. um, <laughs> <laughs> very, very different. So um, I think that really shaped me growing up and how I view life like tremendously. I mean, um, I was like maybe one of three Latinos in mm-hmm. my high school. Um, so very aware of race, not so much interestingly about Latinidad, right? Because like when you are the only one, like you identify as Latino and don't really understand these complexities that we're talking about here. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, that really, and so those not familiar with Simi Valley, it's um, kind of the first town outside of Los Angeles County, um, predominantly white, although it's becoming more and more diverse now. Um, when I was growing up, it was not. Um, and lots of, you know, were infamous for, um, that's where like the Rodney King trial was yeah. moved to. Um, further back, like that's where Charles Manson hung out. So not a very, <laughs> not a very good history, but um, <laughs> you know, it is what it is. We've, I, I've now been living back in Los Angeles almost 20 years. Um, studied English literature. I'm really mm-hmm. kind of passionate about storytelling. Um, I got a master's in literature because when you graduate with a bachelor's in literature, you kind of have no idea what you're going to do. So <laughs> I continued, <laughs> continued down that path. Um, but I was lucky enough to join a program um, at CSUN that um, paid for your graduate degree mm-hmm. um, in exchange for you teaching. Mm-hmm. So I taught um, English literature, um, actually in, in Simi Valley. Um, also taught English language development. Um, 
really love the English language development part, but I was I was a terrible teacher, um, <laughs> which is why I'm in business now. But I, I was literally Googling, like, what can you do with an English degree? And marketing popped up. And so that's how I got into marketing. And um, it's been, like, it's been great for me, like, really being able to, you know, I started, got into marketing when, multicultural and Latino marketing was becoming a thing and mm-hmm. was able to integrate my background, um, my passion for my culture, um, creativity. And so flash forward, um, you know, founded a market research firm. Um, I realized like I really like the data aspect of marketing um, and realizing how important representation is from a data perspective. That's really, you know, a big passion of mine that we've seen right on a national level, like the impact of census numbers, for example. Mm -hmm. Um, So being able to incorporate my passion into business has been great and meeting people like you all. So I'm so excited that you were all connecting because I know we've connected in different parts, but I love this. this Tell us about your tattoos. Opportunity, right? I I know you were going to ask. Yeah, I mean, this is like (laughs) my, 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 you know, I love California. Um, so this is like California bear. Um, I'm a big mountain biker. So I did oh, kind of like, oh, wow. That's right. like That's right. play. Yeah. Um, what else do I have? Just mountains, um, kind of taking the stereotypical symbolism of, of you know, Max, I'm, I'm big into meditation and, mm-hmm. as well. So, um, yeah, and then it, further up. <laughs> I think I, this, this may be a TED talk in the media. Yeah, 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 sure. Shout out to CSUN because I grew up in the Valley. And yeah. so thank you for sharing. And also a uh, shout out to our community colleges or our uh, Cal State and also our state colleges. Awesome. Not, last but not least, Roberto, tell us about your origin story. Feel free to also share what you're working on now so then folks can also be more aware of What's on deck? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you so much, Lydia. I really appreciate you having me with such a distinguished group of folks. I'm like, what am I doing here? Right? Like, <laughs> how did I get into this table? But I do appreciate you being so inclusive. Uh, I am very proud to be the middle child, the invisible child of uh, uh, Norteños. You know, I'm very proud of being Mexican, Mexican-American. My, both my parents came here in the 70s. They met here. They don't have such a cool story. They just met here at a party. Uh, and my, my, uh, my dad was like, that one. Bailando. <laughs> Apartada. You know, like, that's the one. That's the one for me. Uh, but, you know, when I think about my origin story and I think about what I am, you know, I'm very much this idea of what it means to be Norteño. And I, we have an amazing family back in Chihuahua. And, you know, I grew up picking apples. My dad has an apple orchard. I grew up picking apples. And my mom's side, we have huge farmland, cows and horses. And, uh, but I was never accepted into that. It was always as if you're trying to prove yourself. And then I'm back here in, in the United States. I was never American enough, right? Yeah. So it was this dichotomy of, uh, and as I grew up, I started you know, really double down my education to better understand what it means to actually be a Mexican and what's the history of Mexico. Maybe that way they'll accept me more over there. And um, I remember I was 18. And I had dyed my hair yellow blonde, right? And I went back to my little hometown of 200 people in, in Chihuahua. Oh La Cienega de San Isidro. Back in style. Yeah. 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 going to bring you back. Oh, the soccer, I, 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 the people soccer looking at me. We need to you, see pictures. No, no. Yeah. It's so embarrassing. My mom took a little BTS. picture oh my of my graduation. She was like, that's not my son. This is my son. Oh. <laughs> I can laugh about it now, but it hurt. But you oh. know who, who supported me and defended me was my grandfather. Mm-hmm. And he pulled me to the side. like, like it's, it's character. It's your values and who you are. And I remember that inspired me and I wrote a bull for him. I'm like, you know what? I'm, it was a cher- cherrada. I jumped on top of a bull, threw me off in two seconds. Like, boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> but it was such an amazing experience. And I started realizing it's the values that you carry. Who you are fundamentally does not matter the color the, or the creed. It's just what you represent at that moment in time and what family members are instilling in you as you're growing up. So that really helped me better understand what it means to be Norteño from Northern Mexico and what it means to be Mexican and what it means to be American. I went to school locally at UCLA. So we have some USC folks, some Stanford folks, really transformative experience for me, really helped me understand. And I always wanted to serve. My mom is a provider, first of 12. And my really hardworking woman, she's also an entrepreneur. And she always taught me this very valuable lesson that's like, it's you giving. It's not about you, it's about the community that you're a part of. Mm -hmm. And I never really realized, how do I give back? How do I show up authentically and live my purpose? And my mom was always in my head about it. She was like, 
whatever you do, it has to be for others. And I always thought government, and I learned that lesson real quick. Like, no. <laughs> uh, I'll do respect. Okay. <laughs> for the public. For the public. No, no. I mean, to, to be fair, I, I've been appointed in different positions as uh, political uh, appointees, but I just realized that I could do a lot more influence and I could change my community more if I actually get into uh, the business space. And I did an internship and then got into the State Department and was down in Argentina. And a minister of finance pulled me to the side and was like, you're Mexican and you're working for the Americans. And <laughs> you speak Spanish. Help me understand this. He said, listen, go back, get your MBA. And then if you want, you can use your MBA for social good and work on the nonprofit side, for-profit side. Create the system, work within the system that you have, which is a capitalist social uh, system. And then help your community that way. And I took it to heart. I came back. I got my MBA. And... Uh, I, I did some time in New York, came back to, uh, to Los Angeles because that wasn't really for me. I, mm. I tell the joke, I was a drug dealer. I wasn't proud of it, but I wasn't <laughs> above it. I worked for Big Pharma and I was like, this is not for me. You know? Oh, this I is not think that was worse than the drug right? dealer. <laughs> <laughs> it was tough, yeah. And there was, you know, you try to spin it as best you can. We're working in antipsychotic drugs and you start mm, realizing, wow. you know, mm. when people have mental breaks, a lot of it has to do with being low income, a lot of pressure, mm. economic forces press down on you and you just can't do the day to day. And so that helped me justify the action, but it wasn't who I was. Mm. So I came back and uh, I started working with different tech companies as well. And one of my friends and I decided to launch a company uh, and it was a marketing agency for the general market. And great stuff, really enjoyed the work. We worked with some really big brands, uh, you know, Fortune 25 companies and made a lot of money very quickly. And this beautiful young lady to my left of me, uh, actually accepted me to an amazing program. And during that program from Stanford, I, uh, I realized that that uh, owner wasn't as trustworthy, my, my partner mm. wasn't trustworthy. Mm. And at the same time, I had just had my best friend pass away, mm. which was really traffic. We traveled to like 26 countries together uh, and he was Jewish American, you know, blonde hair, blue eyes and you know, Latino, Mexican, Norteño. And it just made sense to us. So it didn't really matter what color or creed we were, it just, it, Good people, good values. But I had to come into Jesus' moment where I realized, okay, what well, it's great to make money, but how do I serve my community? And so I created an agency that's specifically for diverse small businesses. Mm. And Stanford believed in the mission, actually hired me as my, my new agency. And then the, there was a Google rep there that I, I thank her for everything she's done for me. She also believed in me. And she said, I, we're gonna help you get you know, up and running again in this mission of yours to help out the diverse mm -hmm. business community. Wow. So I get started with that and then now the agency grew and started working with a lot of amazing organizations with the whole focus on small, diverse businesses and being able to communicate and show up where they're at, not where you want them to be is a big deal for me. So that's really what my mission now in life is, is to show up authentically, show up where they're at, not where you want them to be. A lot of the times mm -hmm. as community leaders, mm -hmm. We, and especially being in tech, you always think, oh, we create amazing products and services. Let's, if only they do this. And the reality right, is right. you have to accept them where they're at in their journey. So that's really where I kind of started realizing where my true passion and mission is. And since then I started working, you know, with the city of LA, the county of LA, San Diego, Google, Stanford. Uh, and we recently started working with Wells Fargo Foundation to mm -hmm. give away free services to as many diverse business owners wow. as possible. Y con la música norteña. Y con pura sí, banda. Con la norteña. Puro tamborazo. So, <laughs> so actually, let's go to the, the topic of supporting uh, uh, businesses. I personally, I don't know about you, but like, I'm like, it's not, I have a, a hard time with the word small business because I just see them as businesses, right? Mm -hmm. Especially now I see them as uh, any type of business now is tech enablement. I also see a lot of tech businesses. And, and so on that end, we're going to shift the conversation a little bit towards our relationship with money and how are we building wealth? Because I know, especially in the Latinx community, that topic can be very sensitive for a lot of people for many reasons. So since you brought up the Stanford connection, and actually that's where I met <laughs> Jessica. Uh, you were actually one of the first people that I met, I remember when I yeah. first moved. Tell us a little bit more about um, that experience and with the context of like your relationship with money, because now you're an investor side, right? So yeah. you were working on different sides of the table. What's your relationship with money? Especially now as we're, <laughs> right. complicated. Especially as we're getting, status is complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Especially as we're starting to get into the recession and these really uh, times that maybe a lot of folks haven't experienced. And so just wondering, you know, what was that experience like? Yeah. What are things that we should be keeping top of mind? So then that way the folks who are listening can also be prepared. 
disclaimer, this is a complex issue for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'll talk about my experience at the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative. So uh, I was the first employee actually uh, at the Stanford Latino Entrepreneurship Initiative. And we it was started as a research initiative. Mm-hmm. So I actually co-authored the first uh, national research report on the Yay. state of U.S. Latino yeah. entrepreneurship. And I think that's where Mario, yeah. you, See and all these you. connections. Yeah. <laughs> I, love it. I didn't get to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> like no. Um, and it, it was started as an initiative by Stanford professors and Stanford GSB alumni, uh, Hispanic alumni, who knew that there was a gap that existed but needed data to validate what we already knew, right? And not, and I, I want to say this, it's not data to validate our own experiences because we needed to know it, mm-hmm. but because white people needed to know it, mm-hmm. right? So, because we're not really believed, right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, I co-opted this report and found that there were gaps that existed, surprise, right? <laughs> and uh, a lot of it was, yes, access to capital. There were cultural differences and why we were starting businesses, different motivators, et cetera, that, that were leading to Latino businesses not scaling at the same rate as their uh, white counterparts, non-Latino mm. mm-hmm. uh, counterparts. And uh, there was also professional resources, mentorship that was lacking in the space, et cetera. And we created a program, an executive education program, actually. Mm. And I co-created the curriculum with a Stanford professor and to, to customize it for the Latine experience. Mm-hmm. And we accepted 80 entrepreneurs. I, I ran the cohort, two cohorts, and I think those were the first two that, yeah, yeah, first yeah. cohort. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Second. Yeah. So I was like, where's the second cohort? And also, the Tres Lopez, our production team, will yeah. give some and love. Yes. They're, also, they're also, like, right. they worked with us the second cohort yes. as well. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> and, uh, I'll say that I'm very appreciative of the experience and I think it's important uh, for me, the reason I went in is because I understood the relationship of businesses and wealth Mm. and the capitalistic system we Mm -hmm. live under, Mm -hmm. right? Under this capitalistic system, wealth is influences and dictates your quality of healthcare, right? Your access to education and quality of education, your life expectancy, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think I have a problem with it because it shouldn't be that way, right? Right. And uh, I, I understand the importance of building businesses and generating wealth. I helped write those talking points, right? Especially Latino, you know, Latinos as an imperative to the U.S. economy. Uh, however, I find myself uh, increasingly uh, struggling with it because I feel like I'm playing within the system, mm-hmm. right? It's mm-hmm. like we're reforming. We're just continuing to try to reform a system that is inherently unequal, Right. And was inherently meant to have a divide of those who have and those who do not have, right? And for it to work and to thrive, it has to be that way. Mm-hmm. And those who do not have consistently and often are people of color and specifically black, poor, right? right? People of color. And, uh, that's difficult for me. And so, you know, I'm in venture capital, so there's a... <laughs> <laughs> what do you sleep at night? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no. But, but, but it's well, reality, right? We're all yeah, complicit to some degree. And that's part of, like, mm-hmm. what the conversation of yours to have is to address those areas of how do we build yeah. new systems while we're also ourselves as individuals trying to survive with our families, right? Like, right. trying to make our own... So. Explain a little bit more. for me, one, in my actual occupation, the way that I am justifying it to myself on a day-to-day basis is I'm redistributing Mm -hmm. wealth, right, of uh, oftentimes very white, rich people, right, into entrepreneurs that they would never, and people that they would never invest into, Mm -hmm. right? Um, So that's one way (laughs) uh, of looking at it. And then in my personal life, I think... You know, I was behind the generational wealth for a while, probably like early on in those conversations, again, helped write a lot of those talking points. Uh, and I think now I am viewing it more as I don't want to maximize wealth, right? Which is mm-hmm. buying into that capitalistic mm-hmm. society. Let me make as much money as mm-hmm. I can, right? It's very individualistic mm-hmm. when a lot of indigenous Afro communities are very, and even 
Latinx communities from like Mexico, right, which is what I'm familiar with, are very community oriented, Mm -hmm. right? It's not individualistic. And the way that generational wealth is positioned in the United States is, let me make as much money for me and my family, Mm -hmm. right? And then if I have some left over, We'll get <laughs> we'll get to others, and so I think I, I moved away from like let me maximize wealth building to uh, let me redistribute as I am gaining, mm-hmm. right? And in that way, fortifying the community. I'm not waiting till later because the needs are happening now, mm-hmm. and right, we're right. seeing them now. So complicated relationship with with money and wealth. Mm. And it's interesting too, for the folks who may not be aware, there's a lot of different uh, sources of funding. Venture capital Mm -hmm. is one that we've seen, you know, take uh, these big tech companies that we're utilizing. But there's also been a lot of other different flavors of money, such as some of the debt, low interest rate, which sometimes could be another issue, right? Because there's also predatory um, aspects on that. But there's a lot of different areas. So since we have a table of entrepreneurs, feel free to jump in as we're uh, wrapping up this segment of the the money, but also the healing side of with you, your relationship. So anybody feel free to jump right in. I I can start. Um, It's also complicated. Um, (laughs) I think the way that it uh, affects me still is uh, I feel like it's it's fear, um, mm. fear of like taking risks mm. um, or jumping into something new, um, and mainly because I think growing up, uh, because my parents grew up poor, right? They were farmers. Um, education and money were always a thing. Like mm-hmm. I started working when I was ten. Like literally, was a cashier. Washing stuff at my parents' restaurant. Yeah, in Peru. I said in Latin America, a lot, there's a lot of. <laughs> yeah, like sometimes if you go to. Like, so my parents have a Chinese restaurant, like uh-huh. Chinese Peruvian restaurant. So, like, if you ever go to Peru and you go to a Chinese Peruvian restaurant, they call it Chifa, mm-hmm. you literally see a kid, like, doing homework, like, in a, yeah, on the yeah, counter, yeah. like, just like, yeah, that was me when I was a kid. And so that was always in my head, like, oh my God, I gotta, like, study really hard so I can help my parents, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And so nowadays, uh, for me, Money, like the when I think right now, I don't feel fully comfortable with money, and I feel like I will feel comfortable when I make enough money not only to support my parents, which I think they're fine now, but when if I have kids, Mm -hmm. like Mm -hmm. that, they don't have to worry because I've had to worry my even till now, I still have to worry about money. And like, you know, I've had jobs where I'm like, I just have to stay because, you know, all the different reasons that come up in your head, like stability, all that stuff. But I do think that the pandemic was like one of those moments where I was just like, you know what? Who cares about money? Like, you know, life is short. Live your purpose. Live your purpose. Live your purpose. And that's when actually I decided to have a different relationship with money where I was like, Mm. I'm just going to do whatever I want. I'm young. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, figure it out. Yeah, and I'll, I'll figure it out. And actually, I thought um, when I was speaking to my parents and my family, I thought that they were going to be like, you crazy? Like, you have a great job, you know, six-figure job, blah, 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 all that stuff that they tell you. And actually, my parents' reaction was like, we've been waiting for this moment because, mm-hmm. um, you, you, you know, they were like, you are, you are young. You could lose all the money you have right now but you could start again, like, mm. and you, you know, you have hands, a brain, like, you can try all these different things. And to me, that was like such a relief. Like, mm. oh my gosh, I thought this whole time that my parents had this like pressure mm. on me to like succeed, but in reality, they just wanted me to do whatever I wanted, mm. and they worked that hard to make that happen. Um, and like, yeah, the whole thing was like, we didn't work this hard for you to like you know, not do something you like. Right, um, right, right. And so now money is like, I mean, it's awesome to make money, obviously, but um, having the choice of like, you know, picking your own clients and like, yeah. um, you know, working anywhere I want and like doing work that I'm passionate about and I find joy. Like I do everything around joy. If this, one, if, mm. if traveling brings me joy, I'll do it. And so I don't think about it twice. I mean, it's still a thing, like money's still in the back of my head, but um, I'm so, I, I feel like I'm, I'm grateful for, my family, my friends, the pandemic, for giving me the space to think about mm-hmm. what relationship I have with money and, um, and remove that fear that I have around all the decisions I've made in the last 10 years of my life as an adult. You move more towards an abundance mindset, exactly. right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and I think that that's a critical part, especially when you're not used to mm-hmm. having or knowing where things are going to come. All right, so you two gentlemen, <laughs> r- give me, give me yeah. your boom, boom, yeah. boom. Yeah. And, <laughs> What, 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 especially if you're looking at the data, you're helping the entrepreneurs at scale. So 
What was their relationship? What should folks be also be on the lookout as we're going through this really turbulent times? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, like, I'm just starting to unravel my relationship with money, which is complex. I mean, growing up, my parents didn't talk about money. Um, Don't talk I'm, about Bruno. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I'm the oldest of four mm. boys. And so, like, my dad, for me, I think I got a little bit harder than my brothers. Was like, work hard, mm. like, work hard. And that, like, that was the conversation about money. Um, and it's still difficult, like, flash forward, you know, owning a business for 10, 11 years now. Um, I realized that, yeah, you have to work hard, but that's not 100% true. Mm. Um, and at, t at times, like, the working hard mindset and, you know, my dad has a, a blue collar job, right? So I think I internalized that as putting in the hours equals mm. like, yes. like, like, like safety net, right? From a money right. perspective, which upon reflection, right? Going up in Simi Valley and having, you know, looking at my other friends, I tied a lot of my worth thinking that, you know, they were doing better than, you know, my family financially. And I would just thought like, man, their parents must be working harder. And, oh. and, and like when I got older and started to learn about my friend's family's backgrounds, I was like, oh, wow, like they did it. Like they inherited this McDonald's from this street. Like, and I started to unpack all of that, right? right? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, th I think the best thing for me that's happened is owning a business this past 10 years, having conversations mm -hmm. with people. I've had like amazing mentors, people that I've met um, at, at, through like the Stanford program. Um, interestingly, a big change for me in terms of how I think about money and tying like my worth to that, like I was a server through undergrad and mm -hmm. graduate school, like, and I was lucky enough to work at some nice restaurants in Ventura County, like Westlake Village, um, some like high net worth individuals and celebrities that in my mind, like I had never been exposed mm -hmm. to wealth like that before. And like when you're serving like in a fine dining restaurant, like you get to like be part of these people's dining experience for hours. Right. And so you know, when I first started working in that environment, I thought, you know, I just, I don't know, I just I, like thought that was unattainable and these people must mm -hmm. be super smart and work really hard. And after serving them, I'm like, man, they're not. <laughs> like, <laughs> they're not smarter than me, right? Like they're not working harder than me. Like, um, and that completely changed my perspective. Mm -hmm. At that time, I was like, on the road to be a teacher. Mm. Um, but that really, like, that experience, like, it's funny, but, like, it was, like, really a fundamental shift for me, mm -hmm. like, kind of peeking into those people's lifestyles, um, right. hearing their conversations and being like, man, like, I, I can do that, mm. you know? Yeah. Um, but it's just something I'm still grappling with. Yeah. Yeah. It, is, it is a complex issue. Yeah. Tell us in your one second so we can... Yeah. One, one minute. Tell us everything, possible, all the gems, no the, the tweetable version. <laughs> no, the, the tweetable version is money is a tool. And my relationship with money has drastically changed because of that. Mm. I no longer view it, at, and I had zero pressure from my family. My family was just like, don't be a cholo, you're good. No. <laughs> so it's very low <laughs> expectations. And, and I say that in the give a very accepting family environment. So what I realized as certain things in my life condensed is that money is not necessarily, and I'll be honest, it's an end to a means. And if you view it as a tool, you could leverage that tool to be able to scale whatever values and goals you have in your life. And that has been the sh fundamental shift I've had in the past five years. I, mm -hmm. I no longer, my mom, when she knew I got these contracts, she was like, that's great, mijo. When are you getting married? <laughs> <laughs> zero zero regard for like the number. She's like, I don't, it doesn't matter to me. So once I realized that I don't have that much pressure from the family, it's more, how do I leverage these tools for whatever it is? It could be generational wealth. It could be empowering my community. But that's how I view money now. I view it as an end to a means to create tools, financial tools or otherwise, to expedite, accelerate the goals that I have for my community. Mm -hmm. Foundational, I create a foundation, create another company that helps us measure success. Uh, I'm working on creating a fund, a scholarship fund for in memory of my best friend that passed away. Mm -hmm. All little things like that that allow you to live the values and purposes that you have in your life. So. Let us know when you set up the scholarship fund yeah. so that way we could also support yeah. you. San Diego State. And the it's folks can support <laughs> yeah. as well. I love it. So we're going to go into our, like, our lining round, which is the closeout, which is going to be the call to action. Um, and in, in order to do that, I also want to make sure that we address some of the misconceptions, right? So we have this amazing audience. We have folks that are part of the community. What is your, your message to folks who may identify as Latinx, but maybe don't, right? And they want to learn 
about us when you but when you look at how we vote they're like who are these people <laughs> where are they like are they even aligned on values like just looking at this room right we we all come from different uh uh not only countries but backgrounds and and people right and so i'll start with you jessica oh. yes the That's what fun. is the call to action especially how do how can we accelerate our culture move towards building that collective power in this m- new majority that's folks of um multiracial right and yeah. multiethnic and so what can we do as when folks are coming in and be like who are you how can i help but i don't know how to get plugged in <laughs> <laughs> well i think internally as a community uh we have to acknowledge the harm mm-hmm. right and i don't think we can move forward in a a thoughtful and a productive way until we acknowledge the harm and the erasure that has happened for people that are not white latinos or mestizo latinos and that have been centered in narratives and in right. systems uh here in the United States but also in actual Latin American countries. Uh, so I think that's step number one for us. Uh two for us I think we have to continue building community and you talked a little bit about this uh, Roberto and uh to to answer the second part of your question last time uh about what do we do with the recession I think it's important for us to remember that We are very resilient people and uh whether that's a good thing or a bad thing <laughs> right was <laughs> it necessary or not um and in the last recession i uh, i remember in in some of our research that we did we found that although we weren't scaling right our businesses weren't scaling our businesses were actually one of the most resilient mm. through the last recession and that was even though we were small right it was because it was so backed by community and mm. by like the people awesome. relationships right. and i think we have to continue building on that community like and this rem- yes <laughs> and remembering those values right, right? that and, and and continuing to like go back to our roots of people interactions and people relationships. So I think that's the second thing and then for uh for people who don't identify as as Latinos which do I? I don't know. <laughs> right? <laughs> um I think uh we're not a monolith. Mm-hmm. That's I think the important for us to remember as well, right? We're we're not a monolith. There is a lot of nuance within our community. Mm-hmm. Uh we are dictated and motivated by different things depending on where we're from mm-hmm. and if you view us as a mon- as a monolith you're never going to mm-hmm. win us over right um so i think i'll leave it at that since you wanted a lightning round those little That's bit perfect. That was a longer one, lightning two, three. <laughs> totally tweetable <laughs> take notes folks <laughs> roberto i'll just be very straight to the point empathy mm-hmm. um, you know design thinking empathy mapping we love that space in the marketing space just putting yourself in the other person's perspective regardless we are a diverse community uh and having the empathy to be able to step back and alternate your frame of reference mm. is extremely powerful mm-hmm. moving forward in whatever community you deal with and whatever environment you deal with and if you're able to do that consistently and I call it resetting I one of my mentors said everyone is different Rob you can't approach them the same way you have to reset with each individual mm. and that's that's a hard exercise to do but if you approach it from that empathy perspective of seeing the world through their views at least trying to I find that they're very receptive in letting you in, helping you understand. So, mm. I think that's the one call to action. Empathy, have some empathy for the fellow uh, human. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Nice, nice and straight to the point, yeah. but very powerful. <laughs> yeah. Mario. Yeah, I think um lightning round like identity is not a fixed point. I mean, mm-hmm. identity is evolving. Um it's uh you know, we see in conversations with using Latinx, right? Mm-hmm. That's We had a, a segment of, on that uh, last yeah, year. Yeah, <laughs> uh, been a point of tension for the Latinx community, and I think that's, you know, people are very fixated on this is how we define it. But mm-hmm. um, you know, as Jessica mentioned, like this idea of Latina has historically left out Indigenous, Afro Latino, Asian Latinos, um, and it's going to continue to evolve, right? If we look at who's driving like um, interracial marriages, for example, in the U.S., mm-hmm. like it's the Latinx community, and so that's going to evolve even further so i think we have to be more inclusive and understand that identity is not a fixed point it's something that's going to continue to evolve and um that next people are driving that so like we need to be more inclusive by nature that was very tweetable identity yeah. is evolving yeah <laughs> love it there's a tweet there's a tweet for that and there's a lot of great research and data points that we we'll also mm-hmm. share so folks yeah. can also uh, double down yeah. silvia mine, mine is simple um i think on one hand Uh, being proud of where you came from and who you are, 
Um, and then uh, remembering that whenever you do mm. something, because I think we oftentimes just literally forget. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, I think being curious about people. Mm -hmm. I think mm. we are not curious enough to ask questions, right? Like when you meet someone new, it's always just like the generic questions. Where are you from? <laughs> Who you are? And like, yeah, once you get to know someone as a human, I think that's when the connections are actually built. And like, you know, I'm, I'm both Chinese and Peruvian and like there's just so many similarities that most people wouldn't think of. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I think being curious and asking questions, deep questions, not just like the gener right. generic ones um, and, and getting to know the community deeply. I love that. I love that the critical thinking, that not fixating, but being comfortable with things shifting, yeah. going back to the empathy and then being able to really address our own harms, yeah. our own biases, but at the same time also be able to move forward in a way that is inclusive to all. So with that said, this was our first ever edition of what we call the Red Table Jeffersonian Dinner <laughs> with Ina. So uh, if you like this, let us know, you know, put it in the comments, tweet it out, share it out. Uh, we'll be having more content, so I just want to end with saying a huge, huge heartfelt thank you to each one of you because I've also met you in different parts of my life. And I'm so glad that we can show in action what it looks like to build collective power. So thank you all, thank and you thank you, you all for, for tuning in. Go on to the next segment. <laughs> <laughs>